Hello, and good evening from the woods of Maine. Uh, last lecture, we ended at the Permian extinction, uh, thus closing uh, down the Phanerozoic period. Um, we went over, uh, essentially, the, uh, the causes of the world's uh, largest known extinction event um, the, at the end of the Permian, which ends up closing the Phanerozoic period. Uh, so we actually close a period, we go into the Mesozoic um, period, uh, closing the Phanerozoic, going into the Mesozoic, and as we all know, the Mesozoic is the time of the dinosaurs. Um, the state of the Earth is uh, at the close of the Permian, we lost 95% of species, both uh, marine and uh, terrestrial, <clears throat> likely caused from the <clears throat> coming together of Pangaea, um, thus interrupting uh, ocean circulation systems. Um, really what it did is it closed off the uh, equatorial current of the oceans mixing. Um, since Pangaea basically stretched right across the, the equatorial regions to the poles, on more or less one side of the earth, it interrupted the flow of the ocean that's the two world oceans, uh, the mixing of the oceans, um, thus uh, allowing um, the, the, the Paleotethys Ocean, or the Tethys Ocean rather, um, in the jaws of Pangaea, which would be the east side of Pangaea, to get extremely warm, extremely anoxic, and extremely acidic. Uh, and, that, and of course that ended up um, you know, percolating to the rest of the oceans. Um, also in the meantime, uh, global temperatures rose and the <clears throat> areas uh, in central and western Pangaea, both north and south of the equator, became very large desert areas, thus allowing maximum uh, fluctuations of temperatures, uh, the loss of the forest because it became very dry, and this was all because of the huge mountain range that occupied the equatorial area, um, basically that mountain ranging being the, mountain, uh, the, 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 the Appalachian Mountains. So the world is basically um, the world is basically taking a giant shit, um, and life paid the price for it. And now we see ourselves entering into the Triassic period with literally, you know, less than five percent of species making the the cross. Um, the extinction event we lose. Um, a lot of animals, uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, marine species, um, a lot of uh, cephalopods, basically every single uh, animal uh, family is hit to some extent, um, and that is also including marine species as well as plants. Um, everything just got basically creamed um, from the massive changes in climate, and then of course the uh, the icing on the cake was the, uh, the um, Siberian traps, which showed up at the very end of the Permian and basically just took Armageddon and put it into overdrive and cooked everything and left the world a barren, scalding, uh, smoking mess. So anyways, welcome to the Triassic period, the beginning of the Mesozoic. Um, what few creatures do cross the line into the next, uh, mm -hmm. into the next um, era rather, um, are, we have, uh, you know, some reptilians, some reptilian species that make it, uh, obviously fish make it, uh, you know, some sort, some cephalopod make it, uh, the trilobites are gone, um, they were incredibly uh, successful species up until this time, and they su survived for almost 250 million years, and they were wiped, so goodbye to the trilobites. Um, and so what happens now is the earth is very desert-like. It's very warm in some places, very cool in others, uh, massive temperature fluctuations, um, a scorched land surface. <clears throat> Oceans are extremely acidic, very anoxic. Uh, the world is just not a great place to live right now. And the few species that make it <clears throat> are going to start to try to make a comeback. Um, however, it does take time. Um, it, it, in, the, in the fossil record, it, it basically suggests that we 
life tried to get going numerous times and then kind of fizzled. So it took a, it took more than once to get the to get the ball going again on both marine, terrestrial, and uh, plants. And we're going to see that in the next coming slides. So this is the Triassic period, um, <clears throat> sort of in the beginning of it, Lower Triassic, we would call that. And what we see here, here we are, the mountains have been basically leveled. Um, we are starting to see some uh, rifting here. Uh, this would be, this is going to become the top of South America. So basically Panama would come off somewhere over here maybe. Um, this would be, uh, I think Venezuela up here. Um, and then the African continent is right here, and this is going to separate right in here. Um, but that does not happen until another 100 million years or so. Uh, up in here, we're starting to see some separation here, possibly. Um, and this is going to migrate right through here, and we're just going to... Uh, Laurentia, and we'll call it Laurasia because you got part of uh, Baltica over here. These are going to go th separately. To the north and these are going to go separately basically to the north and west and these are going to go to the south and east triassic time 230 million years ago we are absolutely seeing the effects of rifting here massive flood basalts are occurring uh, right up in here we are starting to see the thinning of the continent uh, we're also seeing water and maybe even the, the beginning of oceanic crust beginning to form over here so you've got greenland here We've got, uh, this is going to become the North Atlantic right here. Um, this is Baltica right here, and then Siberia is back over here. Um, Africa right here. This is all going to open up right here. Uh, and then, as I said, this is going to go northwest. This is going to go southeast. You can see the top of South America here. It's starting to, to fizzle down towards and open up uh, at, between uh, South America and Africa. Um, you've got some uh, small plates over here. These are going to uh, basically weld on to the to to uh, Central America and, and parts of northern uh, South America and help create Central America. Triassic period in uh, 210 million years ago, uh, rifting is extending. We are starting to see definitely some ocean basin formation. The rift here is getting wider and deeper as well as the rifting. You can see numerous rift uh, valleys beginning in Grabbins right here beginning to, to separate. And this is all indicating that um, that Pangaea is beginning to uh, separate. And there we are right there. Of course, no mountains really anymore. Um, you've got uh, some subduction over here. Uh, looks like some subduction here. Um, this up here is going to become the Arctic Ocean. Uh, Greenland right here, and then again, this is also now the North Atlantic is beginning to open up a little bit. So, on our uh, timeline chart of uh, the um, supercontinent or the Wilson cycle or, or whatever you want to call it, we have gone from Rodinia, one supercontinent, to the opening of uh, the rifting of the supercontinent of Rodinia, the opening of the Iapetus Ocean, the opening of the Taconic Seaway. We closed the Taconic Seaway uh, through the Taconic Orogeny. We ended up having a strike slip fall going through um, off of northern Africa and northern Amazonia. Um, and then we ended up closing the, the uh, Iapetus Ocean with the closure of Avalonia, um, hitting New England during the Acadian uh, Orogeny. Um, Stripe slip slip faulting continues in the New England region, uh, most noticeably along the Nuremberger Fault. Uh, and then we get Africa colliding and we close the, close the Rayak Ocean. Um, and now we have come full circle. We created Pangaea, so point A to point A prime. And now we are starting into a new Wilson cycle indicated by this right here in the opening of the Atlantic. Triassic period tectonics and paleogeography about 245 million years ago. Uh, we have the Allegheny orogeny right here. I just explained everything. Grenville orogeny, Grenville rifting, passive margin, taconic arc, taconic arc orogeny, uh, exotic crust probably Amazonia, um, uh, probably uh, rifted off of Amazonia, which became the Gandaria terrain. Um, this uh, subducts and slams in uh, a rift zone, forms off of that, brings it across, slams it into the Taconic, um, the Taconic Mountains or the Green Mountains, 
um, creating basically the central uh, New England uh, basin. Uh, behind it, we have Avalonia. And then behind this is this Africa, and subduction continues. Um, and then we bring Africa, and all of this has been smashed right here. Africa is now on its way. I don't agree with these subduction zones entirely. I think that there, there, are, there is more subduction going on on this side as well, but that's neither here nor there. Um, this is everything Africa, Meguma, Avalonia, Gandaria, Taconic, all right here. And then energy fizzles out. Uh, crust begins to stretch and move away, which is right here. Uh, this begins to happen in the Triassic, and we are beginning to see all of this get stretched apart. And underneath here, we'll also get decompressional melting, because uh, once you thin the crust, the, every, the lid that held down a lot of the heat and the, the magma now gets released, kind of like twi slowly twisting a Coke bottle after shaking it. And then we are going to end up coming to here. This is sort of the coast of New England, you know, beaches of Maine, whatever, crust. Gulf of Maine out here, uh, and then we have our Appalachian Mountains, what's left of them here, uh, and that's the way it looks today. But we're right here, so another 200 million years, we're going to be right here where we are today. And during this time, we have, um, we have mountains and basins filling here. We have uh, large-scale uplands from, the, um, from all the material that came off the Appalachians getting deposited by rivers out here, also off of here. Uh, into the Gulf of Mexico, we have uh, some island arc activity, and we have um, now the west coast has become more active. East coast is now settling down. West coast is, is going to become the new subduction area. And if we were to look at what modern day New England might have looked like, or New England might have looked like at around 230 million years ago, I would think that this would be a good analogy right here. In fact, this, even the, the shrubs, it, it probably looks something like sort of low riding, low riding hills, maybe even sediments that were, to, that were shed off the mountains that we are now cutting into even those. Um, but these are all sedimentary deposits here, uh, layer upon layer upon layer. It looks like they've been lifted and they are also eroding. And that's low-lying mountains in a desert area would be exactly what New England looked like about 200 and, and what, 30 million years ago? Triassic landscape. Um, so we have, these aren't, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say these are, di uh, they may be dinosaurs. I don't know exactly what the time period is on this, but this is about when the, the archaeosaurs began to develop. Um, again, I'm a geologist, not a biologist, so uh, my knowledge on the true evolution of these is a bit skewed, but um, the gist of it is, is that this is when the first uh, archaeosaurs began to evolve into dinosaurs or dinosaur-like creatures. And, you can see here we've got something that that definitely looks like uh, a dinosaur kind of going after this this right here um, possibly a plant eater here these look like meat eaters um, but very simple dinosaurs at the time and they more or less all kind of had a very similar design before they start actually diversifying um necessarius paragonti an archaeosaur, one of the first, probably represented on the slide I just had before. I would say that the, maybe this might be it right here. Um, this is one of the first known common ancestors to dinosaurs, um, and it, it establishes itself at around 243 million years. This is, you know, the, the, the granddaddy, uh, the OG of the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are going to develop from this archaeosaur. And so we have our dinosaur family tree here. Um, and as we know, we have a few different types of dinosaurs. Um, we have the uh, bird-hipped and the lizard-hipped, um, and they they separate basically right over right after the uh, uh, they separate in the Triassic after sort of at the beginning of the Middle Jurassic period. I mean, of the Triassic period, and essentially the majority of the dinosaurs that we know of today. Um, are mostly, uh, well, there's a lot more species, it seems, that are bird-hipped. Um, you got your stegosaur, ankylosaur, uh, you got your triceratops species here. Um, these all basically come off of uh, um, lizard-hipped uh, dinosaurs. And then the bird-hipped ones give, give, are basically the, the, uh, the class that, that gives us most of the meat eaters. I think it may, may even give us all the meat eating dinosaurs because that's, uh, that's phylum theropoda right here. Your tyrannosaur, your allosaur, your ceratosaurus. These are all meat eating dinosaurs. And of course, these end up 
um, developing into uh, birds in the late uh, Jurassic, uh, and then they really start flourishing in the, in the uh, Cretaceous. Um, sauropods, um, there's kind of a question mark about these right now. We're not really sure if they belong here or here. We seem to think they go here, but they may be in a class all by themselves. Or maybe the theropods just really truly aren't um, in the classification of dinosaurs as we put them. Uh, maybe we need them. But I've seen some lectures where everything seems to be this, except for a very small, uh, the meat-eating dinosaurs and, of course, the birds. So we'll see where that ends up going. For now, the sauropods are still considered bird-hip dinosaurs. And those are the large um, the absolutely massive uh, okay so uh, evolution of dinosaurs here uh, time is right here so we have a common ancestor here uh, and then of course uh, they start uh, diversifying and so force you have the four digits in the hands boom goes right here this goes to here hollow bones uh the wishbone which is kind of like a bird hip right here so you could go here uh, cubit boot three digits in hand uh hollow cervical feathers right here um and so forth and over time you can see um how they end up coming into birds uh so essentially, the lizard hips went over here, uh, and then they just kept going uh, right up, right up through here. Um, and that is your, your basically your triceratops and your ankylosaurs, what have you. Um, but the bird-hipped ones um, begin to keep uh, diversifying. They, 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 uh, the four-digit ones uh, stop, and then they, they diversify. They become into hollow bones. Then they have hollow bones plus they end up getting less fingers um, the they start to become bigger um, and over time they keep adding uh, um, features that are more bird-like and of course eventually we develop into uh, birds and this is how it all happened right here so they diversify bird uh, lizard hip bird hip the lizard hips go their own way um, but for for the bird, the bird hip, we, we, we develop into small carnivorous dinosaurs, which could develop into larger carnivorous dinosaurs, which develop into really large carnivorous dinosaurs. Um, and then, of course, they begin to uh, grow feathers. Uh, they begin to actually uh, develop what will become a wing. Uh, and then they actually... Um, uh, they become very much... Very, this, is, this is actually the true... Uh, bird um, ancestor right here um, and then the, 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 the talons just get longer um, and of course the wings developed and then of course we lose the, the teeth and it becomes a beak and all of that is just uh, lined out right here again I'm not a biologist but this is um, basically the the evolution that it took so the lizard hip kept the four digits um, and the bird hip kept the four digits for a while, but then the fourth digit began to reduce. Uh, and then um, within, um, let's see, so let's go from uh, 225 million years to about 180, we begin to actually get uh, actually 225 to about 195. Um, what, about 195, we see the loss of the, um, the fingers and... Uh, and we end up getting a three-fingered, three-digit uh, appendage. All right, so the opening of the Atlantic at the end of the Triassic. So a while back, I did a thing where I showed you a slide that showed the opening of the Iapetus Ocean, which is uh, listed here in green. I kind of outlined it here. And this is the opening of the Atlantic Ocean right here in red. And it's, strangely enough, it doesn't entirely go with the original opening of the Iapetus Ocean, but it does follow suit a little bit. This has obviously uh, influenced the rifting here. We have a nice prominent right here that becomes the, front, uh, the Florida uh, promontory. 
Um, we also have a chunk right here uh, that um, this area right here, uh, this is what becomes the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and this was absolutely influenced by the gigantic chunk and the uh, setback that we had during the rifting of the Iapetus Ocean. Um, we see the same, uh, these are all failed rifts, um, these little lines right in here, just like the Iapetus Ocean when, they, when it started. There's failed rifts in here, but they're just one cycle back. So the difference here is that when the, uh, when the Atlantic Ocean opens, the uh, New England embayment becomes more of a New England promontory. So the Acadian orogeny really filled this in right here. And so this, this, is, this is basically the main New Hampshire coastline right in here. Um, and this in Nova Scotia should be up here. Uh, this filled in giantly during the Acadian orogeny. And so we have the actual rifting of the continent way offshore, although uh, right here in Connecticut, uh, offshore of, of Maine and, New, and Mass and New Hampshire, all the way up into the Bay of Fundy, we have numerous rifts that tried to open. And the middle of Connecticut was going to be the, uh, the ocean, um, the shoreline. Um, in fact, if you were to be in probably, say, um, Canton, um, Avon, you'd be on an island. In Canton, you'd be in Connecticut, you'd be uh, at the beach. But it shifted and it ended up opening for much further east, about 600 miles or so to be, actually not 600, about 400 miles or so east. Um, and that's where the actual rift be, uh, happened. So if we look back at this, this is the, the these are the original craton or shield of North America. Um, this right here is a mid-continent rift that tried to open uh, at some point during the Grenville orogeny. This is all over a billion years old. The Grenville orogeny deformed this whole area right here um, that built back about 1.3 to 1.0 a billion years ago. Uh, that This rift uh, occurred at about 750 uh, million years ago after this range, uh, this mountain range uh, began to erode, it began to, to uh, uh, thin, and then you had decompression of melting, and then you had the rift, rifting of the Iapetus Ocean. And then the, um, the ocean, Iapetus Ocean closed, built all of this blue right here, which is the uh, Appalachian orogeny. Um, and then the Appalachian Mountains built, they grew, they shredded, they thinned, and then they too uh, allowed the crust beneath uh, them to, to thin. And you had decompression melting, and then you have the rifting of Africa um, and Baltica off to the east. And now we have the opening of the Atlantic Ocean, and these are just the check marks and the transform faults and the rifting event that created. And then, of course, we had a piece of uh, Africa left over here that made the, uh, the, the Florida promontory zone. Uh, the, the Florida, basically, it, it, underneath of the majority of Florida is a piece of, uh, of African crust that got stuck behind. And as you can see, uh, if you go back here, you know, these basically end up being this right here. And you can see the transform faults. This is, sorry, these are the transform faults, and that's the ridge. These are transform faults, and then this is the ridge. So that's what the Atlantic Ocean looks like today. This is a very old map. Um, this was done back in the late 60s and 70s. I had this map as a child, and uh, I got this globe, and it's beautiful, and it gives you an idea of what this middle of the Atlantic Ocean looks like. And it has a gigantic mountain system, probably the largest on Earth, uh, and it has, uh, and it's, and this side's going this way, this side's going this way, and it doesn't happen evenly. You have parts of it that that sometimes, you know, like right here, this is going this way. But at the same time, this is going this way, so you have a little bit of, uh, of uh, transform fault right there. This is the new rift zone, the subduction zone of the Caribbean. This will be, this is likely the beginning of the closing of the Atlantic Ocean, but it's going to take a long time. This will probably snake its way right up into here and create a huge arc and a subduction zone right here. Uh, we know that one is beginning to form right here. Uh, we also have one way down here uh, near the tip of uh, South America and Antarctica giant tramps from fault right here um, and then we also have the separation of, of Greenland from North America and this this area here this rift seems to be essentially dead uh, it is not continued to go um, and this rift right here more or less you kind of extends right into here if you really think about it you bring everything back together yeah this more or less fits I believe right here 
I think that 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 this right here is just an extension of the rifting that began right here, just more or less due to this right here. All right, so um, from stable continent to rifting apart in the Wilson cycle. Um, so we have gone from, um, you know, we, all right, let's just do the whole thing. Uh, we had an ocean, this is the Iapetus Ocean, Iapetus mm -hmm. Ocean closed, uh, tectonic orogeny. Then we had Africa come over and collide with it. Uh, and then everything stopped and everything began to uh, thin out. And then you had the crust begin to, to, to get uh, thinner. Obviously, it began very thick here. Um, it became very thick. Now it begins to thinner. Now, once you take all this weight off and you erode everything out, there's an area down here that's been just... This root right here got very heated. There was probably melting, but it can't go anywhere because it's being held shut. And it's still being held shut right here. This really should just show this whole area being melted right here because that's what's happened. And it's trying to get through, but it hasn't quite been able to do it yet. Well, this is going to really start to... Uh, the pressure is going to come off. We're going to start to see more melting. We're going to start to see this heat up. Um, and then you're going to see it start to do something like this. Um, and this right here, this magma that's being generated, now begins to find its way up. Once, once you start to pull apart these, these land masses, you have fractures that go right down through the crust. Because this goes this way, this goes this way. And then you have uh, common uh, normal faulting right here. And guess what? This stuff finds its way up and starts to flood this area with uh, mafic basalts. Um, at first, it actually starts to assimilate some of the uh, some of the actual crust, but over time, very quickly, it becomes very. Um, in fact, you might get gabbroic. You might even get some felsic stuff, but it really gets mafic quickly, and then it begins to fill this basin with mafic crust, and then it eventually the continental crust separates, and then the mafic lavas begin to fill the center, uh, which you see here begins to make this type of crust, and lava continues to keep coming out here. So. Um, Apologize, I had to fix something. So this is, I had to bring these, um, these, uh, uh, these text boxes out. So this basically explains that, you know, the reduction in weight causes the pressure at the base of the crust and it begins to melt. Um, and this is decompressional melting. And then the magma generates begins to rise uh, and melt more crust, making the magma uh, making more magma that's forcing it, the crust upward and to split apart, which is rifting. And it also becomes more felsic and, and uh, through crystal fractionation and makes it a little bit lighter. All right, Jurassic period. So this is the Jurassic period. Uh, this is really when the Atlantic Ocean begins to open. Uh, and uh, it, really, that's the main thing. That This is when uh, the... Um, Gondwana or the southern continents go their way and the northern continents go their way. So we are now going to separate completely here in the Jurassic period and you can already see uh, the, the, the signs of it starting right now. So 195 million, uh, you're starting to get a little bit of, of, uh, of an ocean uh, basin in here and you're starting to see a little bit of ocean crust, maybe not quite much more rifting here. You're starting to see uh, definitive uh, lines of separation. Uh, the crust is getting very thin. Um, we're seeing uh, more evidence of water coming in here in oceans. You're starting to see a line right here. This will eventually become the North Atlantic. Um, and then there's rifting up here as well. 180 million years ago, uh, the ocean basin is beginning to open and unzip here. You're starting to see more oceanic uh, uh, crust in here. Uh, still, it's it hasn't quite happened yet, but this is definitely getting wider. Um, and again, bigger and larger uh, normal faulting between um, uh, the East Coast and Africa. At 170 million, we now have a clear, obvious separation of uh, of Laurasia and the Gondwana, which would be uh, South America, Africa here. Uh, North America and um, a, uh, Europe here, but as you can see, we are getting absolute uh, rifting and separation right here. This has now become a small ocean basin. You've got oceanic crust forming down here, full oceanic crust forming here, and a full separation between uh, North America and Gondwana. And there's a continued amount of rifting and subduction. I'm not rifting, but subduction going on here. 
uh, making all sorts of terrains in the west. We have a little bit of an interior seaway right here, which is going to really start getting bigger in the uh, Cretaceous. By 150 million years ago, you can clearly see that this is the Atlantic Ocean opening. Um, you can also see that the terrains that have been hitting and welding onto Western North America <coughs> have started to take shape into something that looks a little more familiar today. Here is um, uplifted crust that is forming the uh, Central America. These will become the ranges of uh, the Rockies in North, Western North America. Um, Gulf of Mexico forming right here. A little bit of a of a uh, strike slip fault faulting going on right here. This is more or less going this way. Uh, it looks like I mean you could say that this is go this is not going that it, it is going this way. I guess so that is true. This is going this way. 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 And what is happening is right in here. This is kind of connected to South America, and we are getting. Um, in, in relation, this is moving to the left as, and this is moving to the right. And so we're getting this dragged down um, and we're getting the Central America uh, um, the Central America uh, isthmus forming. Uh, this might be Cuba maybe or I'm not really sure, but this is a fragment. It's almost like a prism right here of um, or a wedge. Um, and I do think that this this probably becomes Yucatan. I, I don't know, I'm not sure. Uh, but in any case, this is uh, what's left of uh, the chunk that was left over from here that is now part of Florida. And you've got flooding in the interior seaway. I mean, not the flooding of the interior seaway, but you've got flooding um, into some of the uh, east coast here. Um, after the rifting event, this is becoming a passive margin. Africa goes its own way. I think that is part of it. Could be Nova. Actually, yeah. This might be Spain, Portugal. Uh, anyway, so this is North America. And this, we are now calling it North America. North America, 150 million years ago. We are now here. We are in a full, we're, we're right here again. Uh, we are, we are, we are rifted everything apart. And we have a coastal plain. We have the Atlantic Ocean. We have the East Coast that we see today, the Valley Ridge Province of the Southern Appalachians. And this is what it looks like today. Um, we have what's left of the Appalachian Mountains and the Jurassic. Uh, they're more like highlands. We are having erosion still from, uh, from those right here being poured onto the Atlantic margin. Uh, the Canadian Shield is also eroding. You have lowlands. You've got sort of an interior sea out here through the central, it's more or less the Midwest. Uh, not the Midwest, but the, mm -hmm. uh, the Great Plains into uh, the Eastern Rockies. Um, and then, of course, you have all sorts of tectonic activity. You've got a big old trench right here. Um, because uh, there's uh, subduction on the west coast, as well as subduction up here in the, on the uh, northern side of the um, of North America. Uh, this is these are some some uh, might be the Brooks Range of Alaska. I'm not sure, um, but there's a lot of exotic terrains on the west coast coming that are and they're being. This is happening during the Mesozoic. Ah, uh, Jurassic period landscape. Uh, we all know, we're familiar with the, uh, I don't know, this could be, it's a sauropod, it's just a giant uh, plant-eating dinosaur um, with uh, offspring here, uh, the mothers, they travel in herds to protect. Um, I don't know exactly what dinosaur this is. It could be, I don't know, it could be an allosaurus. It's got the, the ridges right here, so anyway, that's what it looked like uh, in that time. Now we are moving on to the Cretaceous period, and we have a true Atlantic basin right here. We have the South Atlantic opening up. The Tethys Ocean has uh, been um, opening up, and there's subduction going on underneath uh, Asia. Huge, huge, huge subduction zone that, you know, all the way from, we'll just say, the Mediterranean to uh, what would be modern day. Uh, We'll just say Papua New Guinea, but this is a huge subduction zone, and the Tethys Ocean is getting sucked under it. And as it does it, it's pulling Africa this way. It is absolutely ripping uh, India, and, and India is going to start moving very quickly across this ocean, and it's going to slam into Asia ver uh, in the next uh, 50 million years. Um, Australia is now going to get, because of this subduction, Australia is going to get pulled off of uh, Antarctica. Antarctica is going to go south and end up on the pole. 
Um, we have subduction going underneath the South America that's now going to form the Andes Mountains. Central America, subduction under the Rocky Mountains forming the Rockies, uh, the Interior Seaway. This is probably one of the most famous lone lo localities for dinosaurs in the Cretaceous and the Jurassic. The Interior Seaway of North America, shallow, uh, fairly warm, and lots of life. And we find so many dinosaurs in here. Triceratops, duckbills, ankylosaurs. Uh, Tyrannosaurs, uh, Allosaurs are all in there, and they all lived right along this interior seaway that was thriving with life. Um, we find the, the reason why we find that the majority of dinosaurs here is because this was ideal for for creating um, fossilization. Um, you know, you have areas where there's you know swamps and and uh, murky stuff, and something dies and falls in that place. You have volcanoes right here, so you have Probably a good amount of eruptions that happen uh, frequently. Uh, pyroclastic flows dusting the place, killing stuff immediately, and then dropping it into this, uh, this seaway that may or may not had conducive uh, properties for fossilization. But we find a lot of fossils right here. And one can make an argument. We find tyrannosaurs on both sides and basically the same species on each side. Um, it's a good bet that they also extended out to the east coast. Uh, we just have not found them yet. Um, the East Coast was scraped um, numerous times from ice ages. There's been a ton of erosion since the, um, the Cretaceous period, and it's quite possible that, um, you know, any of that material has been erased. The, and, and, and the one place that we do find um, dinosaur fossils on the East Coast is in the Mesozoic Basin of Connecticut, um, where in the Jurassic, uh, the... Atlantic Ocean tried to open up there, but it, it had an interior seaway, it had water, it had swamps, it had seas, it had all that, and sure enough, um, there's an area here called Dinosaur State Park where in the Jurassic there's footprints of at least three dinosaurs plus possibly a predator following them, and that's because this is the only part, the, the reason why we see that is because this is the only Mesozoic materials that we see um, that are sedimentary deposits along the East Coast. Everything else um, of this age, uh, we didn't have any, um, we really didn't have any uh, deposition of, of materials from this particular time because at that time the mountains were all eroding and uh, there was rifting. So, so literally all the, the sediments that were poured down at this time have been stripped. And all we, they've been stripped down to what we see, which is essentially Ordovician, Devonian, and Silurian sediments. All the upper sediments have been stripped away and gone, with the exception of this, 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 uh, this valley that formed in the Jurassic period. And the reason, the only reason we see it is because it formed in a valley and did not get eroded. Of course, the other mile and a half so of materials that were deposited above that are now gone. They might have been loaded with dinosaur footprints or any of the materials around here that were getting deposited at the time on the on the shoulders of these mountain ranges, but they are just long gone and destroyed by erosion. So that's why we don't see them. But we're pretty sure that Tyrannosaurs or something like them probably made it out to the East Coast. We just haven't found the evidence for it. Um, Cretaceous period, 130 million years ago. You have now the North Atlantic beginning to open. You have, uh, yeah, I was this, this is sort of the, the uh, Portugal thing, uh, Spanish thing, this France here, England over here. Um, you have uh, Baltica here. This is, you know, going to be uh, Finland, Norway, at Northern Africa here. Um, the South America here. The split's going to happen here for the South Atlantic. Hasn't quite happened yet. Gulf of Mexico, uh, Yucatan, uh, Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, Atlantic Ocean. Here we are. Uh, and again, we still have some highlands here, but there's really not much going on. We are now in a passive uh, margin. And we are seeing, we're building up the guts of the west coast of the United States right here by all these island arcs. Huge trenching going on up here. Alaska is now starting to come into fruition. 100 million years ago, we have the interior seaway. We have the opening of, uh, this looks like maybe the Arctic Ocean. Um, this is where your, your, your formations, where you find all your dinosaurs and stuff on, in the west coast and the badlands. Um, the Atlantic Ocean is now getting wider, deeper, uh, more mature. We now have the separation of South America from Africa. Gulf of Mexico is looking kind of like the way it normally does now. Um, and then, of course, the Florida uh, prominent is right here. Um, but again, this is our 
dinosaur uh, dinosaur haven right here. We're going to find all sorts of stuff in there. And by 75 million years ago, the temperature has continued to increase. And one of the reasons the temperature has increased is because we have all this ocean uh, cr oceanic crust forming. And when you have a, a, a huge ocean opening like this, you have a tendency to raise the whole... When lava is coming up under the ground, it raises um, basically the the floor of the ocean. And when you raise the floor of the ocean, the water gets displaced and it raises sea level. And this is a time of incredible tectonic activity in ocean basin building. And of course, because of that, uh, we have um, we have uh, rising the rising of the uh, ocean crust. And of course, that rises sea level plus the planet's warm. There aren't a lot of glaciers, uh, if any. Um, and so we have interior flooding of the continent. And again, this is where we find all our dinosaur fossils. Now they're, you're going to find them here. They're going to be along here. They're along here. Uh, they're along here. They're all here. These are gone because, you know, they've been a lost erosion. But this out here, we still, we, this is where they find the majority of our Cretaceous dinosaurs. And here we are at 600 and, uh, 65 million years ago. We are really starting to recognize you have the, the rift open, separating Greenland from us slightly, the North Atlantic, you have the Arctic Basin right here. Notice that the seaway has begun to, to, uh, to, to shrink. And that is because the activity on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is now beginning to, has, has begun to slow in the last 40 million years or so. And so sea levels are dropping. And when you take the water out of an area this size, and it's also on other continents, and the shelves, and the shelves here, and the shelves here, and here, and here. This spells disaster for uh, many species. And this is prior to the impact. Um, when you, all the species that lived here in shallow seas can no longer live there because they, there's no water. So they had to either die or adapt. Um, and a lot of them began to die. And this interior seaway also controlled the weather. Um, when you have a lot of water in here, the water regulates weather. It makes it sort of sort of makes it not quite as radical. You don't get the, the huge swings in temperatures because the water takes more energy to heat and cool. Um, but when you had the seaway here, it kept the continent fairly regulated. Well, now that's gone. You're starting to get massive temperature fluctuations in here, and the temperature is cooling. Um, so the species that lived here uh, had to adapt or die, and then the things that ate those had to adapt or die, and the things that ate those that ate those have to adapt or die, and so on. So we're... The Earth is beginning to have problems, and the dinosaurs are beginning to feel the pinch. Um, and this is probably Cuba right here. Uh, you're having the development of a uh, of a new subduction area right here, uh, strike slip fault right here. Uh, you have Mexico right here, South America, and and what looks like now we're starting to see California coming into play here. Southern California is being built. The Rockies. This is uh, the Laramide orogeny, I believe. And here we are. Cretaceous paleogeography, 100 million years ago. What is going on? We have a massive amount of mountain building back here. Lots of volcanic activity. Lots of explosive and dynamic stuff. A big giant trench off here. Lots of stuff going on. Um, you have the interior seaway, which is getting sediments from both here and here. Um, you have what's left of the... Uh, the uh, Appalachian Mountains, which are now probably just rolling hills, uh, but they're still putting out some sediment, and then you have the Atlantic Ocean right here. Uh, you're getting shale and deep deep ocean uh, shale deposits here, maybe some limestone because it's on the equator. You're getting shales over here. You're getting sands near the coast. You're getting conglomerates here. Um, so that's the story of what's going on there. Cretaceous period landscape. You've got a duckbill and the greatest carnivore ever to walk the earth uh, and you know this guy was such a badass uh, animal that it still haunts human beings 65 million years later so that I guarantee I'm not gonna be scaring anybody 65 million years ago and if I years from now and if I do well I got it'll probably be a movie about me and of course this happens you know being alive at that day just must have sucked you know, I, I mean, these things, they, they cannot comprehend what's going on. They just know that their lives are about to end. And it's 100 million years of, uh, actually, it's, uh, let's see, so it's from two, uh, what was it, two, 220? So 220, 120, 
and another 60, so 120. Almost 180 million years, these guys ruled the Earth. Not these particular species, but the dinosaurs did. And uh, the world was already in bad shape towards the end of this. Um, and then you have this asteroid, and uh, that's just the icing on the cake. You know, these are, you know, there's arguments made that they're somewhat warm-blooded or what have you, but I don't think they were completely warm-blooded. Um, and it's pretty obvious that they, if they were, they just could not adapt quick enough because the mammals that are warm-blooded came out of the shining. These are large. They require a lot of energy to, to survive, and uh, they eat things that were cold-blooded, and if they're gone, well, these guys are gone. So, um, and it was an amazing design. This is 180 million years of evolution. We'll just even go that. We'll go, we're going to go, you know, 300 million years of evolution designing this just beautiful. It's, it's basically a mouth with teeth on powerful legs. No need for an arms. You just, you're balanced by your tail and your head, and this is your locomotion, and you are just, you're, I mean, if this was a, it's, it's like a charging football player, and this is the weapon. I mean, this is made to do nothing more than kill, and people can say it's a scavenger, and maybe, it, I'm sure it did scavenge, but I'm sorry, you don't have legs this big, uh, uh, this powerful to just walk up to something that's already been dead, and you certainly cannot be that optimistic uh, to, to just solely feed off of scavenging. This requires an enormous amount of food. Um, and not to mention that the eyes are forward facing. Um, yeah, granted, it did have a good sense of smell. It needed it. Um, and like I said, it, it probably did both. But this thing, is, this is a true uh, evolutionary piece of, uh, just a remarkable piece of evolutionary uh, design. And no explanation needed the world is already having a tough time and then this happens so i'm going to end this part right here and then we'll go into what happens